Hi everyone. Uh, wow, I am so full of emotion after eight days of spiritual enlightenment and the whole series of Pesach and I can't get over um, my inspiration when I landed <laughs> in my home and Ruth Devorah Wallen, which was one of the speakers in this event, gave me this book called The Torah-like Wit and Wisdom of Michael Franklin Ellis. And I only even got to the first few pages of the memorial of how incredibly like soft-spoken but witty, warm and fun-loving and there and compassionate, all these different things about how all of his family members just saw him as. And I was just like, wow, that's a person who lived a life full of self-mastery, emotional mastery. That's a person who actually had the power to give it his best and no matter what no matter who no matter what was going on in his life and that's what today is all about to really get to the key points of how to have more emotional mastery because we've worked so hard for so many years around the corner a next event happens and all of a sudden new variables, new circumstance, and we find ourselves sometimes back to square one. Or maybe not square one, but like, ugh, again? Like, how did that happen? So I hope really after tonight, we'll really get to the bottom of the key ingredients to be able to be more free, to have that emotional freedom, to give our best to the others around us. First and foremost, we have to understand we are humans in the making. We are not human yet beings. It's a process. And the more we accept the process, the less bitter and anxious we are, the more we can take that deep breath and step forward and ahead. So embracing our perfectly imperfect being helps us be a little less anxious and then we have the wherewithal to do what it takes to be a better, beautiful neshama here. So we see that Hashem created us in this way uh, and it's not our fault and it's not our doing. And when we really understand that, then we have faith in ourselves. The Lubavitcher Rebbe actually teaches us that in order for us to be able to get to that place of faith in ourself, not only faith in God in the way he also created us, but it takes effort. Just like if you look at the word emunah, it comes from the word le'amen. We have to train ourselves first and foremost to have faith in ourselves, even in the midst of our weaknesses, even in our midst of those moments where we don't have emotional mastery. When we have more faith in God, then of course we have more faith in the God in us. When Moshe Rabbeinu was at the mountain and he was asking God, please, please let me see the face of you. And God says, no, 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 no. I'm not going to see I'm not going to let you see the face of me. You can only see the back of me. The message was, in the back of you, you will find me. So the second step is to really understand how godly you are. That in you is a chelek elokai mamish. In you is a part of God's spark, a part of his holiness is in us. So the more faith we have that it's going to happen day by day, the things that we're going to do to help reveal and redeem ourselves in this way, the more we have the ability to love ourselves, accept ourselves, then we're a little more free each day to be the better person that we are. So this whole thing during... 
Pesach that we just experienced was making order out of the chaos because there's a lot of chaos. There's an emotional outburst sometimes. There's the mind that's so confused and there's the world around us that is so chaotic. There's the to-do list. So emotional mastery means that even when it's so chaotic all around us, that we have the power to be stoic, to be present, to be grounded, hopefully more and more, especially after this class. We see that it's no big deal when everything's going your way and everything's calm to, to, to have that kind of you know, sense of harmony and, and, and self-mastery. It's when the test gets tough and when things are not going our way, that's when we need to bring the order out of the chaos. You see, there was a story of a chassid that was watching one of the rebbe's praying. And he asked him, do you pray with the tzibur? And he said, yes, I do. But a few times after he saw that he wasn't actually playing, you know, praying with the community, he actually was lingering because tzibur means with the public. So he wasn't really. So he asked him, well, you, the other day you told me that you pray with the tzibur. So he says, yes. Every day I wake up in the morning and I collect. Tzibur means to collect. I collect my soul powers so that I can have a better day. And this is one of the main key ingredients to being able to help yourself get to that self-mastery. The Gemara teaches us that when the neshama leaves in the evening and comes back in the morning, it doesn't have an easy access to come back in to our heart and to our mind. It's kind of waiting at the door almost. It says actually it waits in your nose, interesting enough. And only till the spiritual practices are taking place only till the fiery prayers make the body, make the heart, and make the, the mind ready, does the soul re-enter fully the person. What does that mean? If it's kind of stuck, then it means that the Sahara, the evil inclination, the more base animalistic tendencies dominate the mind and the heart. Do you remember when Yosef was in the pit and there was no water? Why do we have to know that? The deep teachings of the Torah teaches us that the brain is likened to a pit. And if it is empty of the waters of Torah, if it's empty with the positivity of all that Hashem gives us so graciously in His Torah, then the scorpion and snake-like thoughts, ruminations, and all kinds of negative, you know, processes of our minds that make us feel beclouded and makes us feel confused, takes place. So the more we fill up our body with our soul, the more our soul has the power to use the mind and the heart in a kosher and amazing way, and the more the person has the freedom to collect all the soul powers, and especially right now, after we witness the experience of everything that the Jewish people got at at the time of the first redemption, when the Jewish people were leaving Mitzrayim, we got all that. And between that day and 49 nights later till Matan Torah, Hashem has gifted us with enormous extra potential power to pass over, actually, the regular steps to this self-mastery, especially if you're going to hopefully do the Sifirat Omer daily. And what was it about Nisan that was different than even Rosh Hashanah? 
Nisan actually is the time of the celebration of the birthing of our people the birthing of spirituality, the birthing of being able to take godly powers and infuse it in our mind, in our heart, in our body, in the physical things around us. Rosh Hashanah is a celebration of the creation of the physical man, of the physical world. So the Nisan time is like a time period to experience the joy of finally having all the tools at our disposal to really do tshuva. And what is real tshuva? As the Baal Shem Tov teaches us, and this is a very important concept to free yourself finally from the inner avengers that are inside of you. The Baal Shem Tov says that real tshuva is stop thinking about yourself. And instead, work on thinking about how great God is, how grateful you are to Hashem, how you are so appreciative of the little miracles in your life, how you have awe and wonderment of wanting to bond and connect to your Creator, of having to do anything possible to fill your mind with His greatness so that you stop thinking about yourself. Because many people think tshuva is, oh, I'm not good enough, I have still this, I, I have to fix that, and they get a little obsessed with the self, all in the name of Hashem, all in the name of wanting to be a better yid, all in the name of the challenge of living in one's own skin. So, this tshuva of Nisan is a tshuva of the first tshuva of Rosh Hashanah. Because the first Rosh Hashanah tshuva, we may have been too focused on ourselves. Although we're taught that we should really celebrate coronating the king. But, you know, if you look at the whole story of the escaping of Mitzrayim and then getting to that point of the sea, what happened? That reference of, of being right at the sea reminds us, you've, you did a tshuva. You decided you're not going to be angry anymore. You decided you're going to really work on spiritual growth and to be a better person. And yet, you're stuck. And you're not there yet. And then you may feel frozen. Then you may feel you can't go forward. And maybe your first tshuva then ends up petering out. Because you kept trying and you weren't getting the answers of how to. And you kept feeling stuck. So we have to realize that, yes, we will have times in our life where it appears like there's so many blockages. And it appears that we can't seem to get over ourselves. But remember the story one time I may have said, those of you who are listening out there, when I was crossing a street and I saw a brain like moment it was like a it was like an aha brain moment and i couldn't believe this dog was uh, near a cat and crossing a street with the life of a blind man right there and i'm like i know dogs and i know dogs that see cats and if i like am witnessing this miracle that this dog is not chasing the cat then we have hope because if a brain of a dog, sorry dog, but if it could accomplish this, then how much more so ourselves? So we can't let the obstacles get in our way. We have to know, yagati umatsati tamin. If we put the effort, but we have to throw the end goal of being available to us in an instant. We have to understand, yagati, we're going to make the effort. We're going to try again. And we're not meant to be perfect. One of the main themes of our prayer service every day is to do a sacrifice of our perfectness. You know, when the Jewish people were at Har Sinai and they witnessed such an, uh, like a revelation of, 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 of a spiritual excitation, and then they had to come back in the body, you know, they like left their body. And, and God was saying, you know, I know you had a, a, a high right now, but you're going to go and you're going to do the sacrifice 
Why? Because you're not meant to be perfect. Sacrifice the, the desire and the need to be shalem. And then again, as we said earlier, then you have a little more breathing space to say, ah, it's okay. I had a little fall and this little fall, which the, the Baba Cherebi teaches us, will bring me to a springboard and it'll motivate me actually to get to a higher level. So, but for this fall, I would probably be status quo. But for this mistake or this seemingly, you know, low moment of my being, I wouldn't be driven to, to work a little harder, to be even better. So we need, as it were, sometimes these falls. And we have to every day remind ourselves, I'm sacrificing perfectionism. And if you know the word, shalom comes from the word shalem. And shalom means peace. We have to be at peace that we're not whole. So we see that one of the main also key ingredients is, uh, for prayer is to help us understand how to protect our heart from the things that are happening around us. When you think about when do you most lose yourself mastery and feel emotionally charged in a not good way is when we deal with people. When, when this one says that and when after everything that I did, you know, like I'm not seemingly getting back a minimal reciprocation, a minimal gratitude, it's so possible to feel so heartbroken and so devastated almost like you don't want to put any effort anymore and then you become so enslaved that your mind could be so dominated by what just was that you lose the moment of the now and what will be so understanding just like you're not shalem they are not shalem and it has nothing really to do with you just like you have your weak points and maybe they have a little more. And just like you have to be at peace that you're not perfect. When that incident happens with that person, you have to protect yourself. They are not perfect, period. You are not perfect, period. And protect yourself. Don't get swallowed up by their journey. Don't get swallowed up by their weakness. Easier said than done if you don't do this kind of training. If every morning you're not supplying your soul with nourishment and your soul is in captivity, because the Tanya actually teaches us the godly soul, the power that has the emuna, the power that has compassion and mercy and forgiveness and tolerance of those you love, is entrapped in your animal soul. And so the more you do the spiritual practices, the more your soul becomes more free. And then it's like, I can't even tell you what happened to me yesterday and I'm going to share with you. Only because again and again, I see this pattern in my life. And it could be your pattern too. I just came back from a long trip and we, we, we landed home and it was a birthday celebration so we didn't have time to unpack. Came home very late. Next day, woke up and my books were packed. The books that I use daily in my spiritual practice. And then I had like this person give me this uh, thing that I needed to do and I, I, I didn't have my book to, and I didn't do my 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 spiritual practice and I couldn't believe it I actually then later that night unpacked and I'm like oh my gosh that's why I was more emotional today yes two friends of mine I found out passed away yes I heard another not good news yes something else happened but those kind of days happen to me almost in some weird way almost every day it's something or another in my position as a health counselor and a healer and you know I hear all day long and yet that day I was just like 
you know, even crying as my daughter was leaving me. Again, she comes back and forth. And normally, okay, I, I'm sad and it's hard, but I like burst into tears. And she's like, Mom, you know I'm coming back in a couple of months. And I'm like, I don't know. I, I guess each time it's harder. And at the time, I didn't connect that I forgot to unpack. I didn't do it because what happened? And this happened to me even in Israel when I was actually... Um, with my mother in Israel, you know, I had been doing my spiritual practice of, of praying in the morning, and this is the second most important ingredient. And then I would just like learn later. And I don't know, I was super emotional. I, I couldn't believe what was happening to me. And there comes the words of the living God. And this actually I want to read it to you because it's really a key ingredient to emotional mastery. Because, you know, when you bake a cake, you can't do it the way you want it. If you put the dry ingredients in the, you know, in the oven first, and then you decide you like the milk ingredients and eggs after, it's not going to be a cake. When we want to have more emotional mastery, God gave us the recipe, and we have to follow it. And here what it says here. What could take place when you pray and you arouse all the emotions? Because what is prayer? Prayer is allowing your godly soul to access all these beautiful emotions of love of God, of joy, of all these emotional powers of ours, of compassion. But look at here what it says. If it is not followed up by the study of Torah after praying, it is possible for one's zeal to be diverted to improper things like intolerance, anger, even haughtiness, a desire for worldly temptations. Basically, the Torah learning after prayer helps cool down the emotion. It helps balances it. If we don't do that, then like what happened to me yesterday, I was so super emotional, out of the ordinary than I usually am, or when it happened with my mom. And this is when I read this. And I'm like, oh my goodness, because I've been learning later when she takes a nap at two or three in the afternoon, and it wasn't following after. And if you even look at the Shema, the Shema tells us exactly these secret ingredients. Shema Yisrael, meditate on the oneness of Hashem. Deeply connect your mind. Focus on how great Hashem is. Vahafta. Then this will develop this amazing emotional love of Hashem. And then it says, Vedibarta bam. Meaning, you need to follow with the speaking of the words of Torah after you pray to cool down the emotion. I mean, look what happened in this week's Parsha. Acharemos. How many times people can have zealotness for Hashem. In the name of God, they'll stand up in shul and emotionally be all over the place as they're giving it to this person who's whatever, behaving. First of all, you're not allowed to shame people. One of the Ten Commandments is do not kill. And one of the Mepharshim say... We don't kill people, come on. If you're going to pick 10, our people don't kill. The killing is like shaming. And shaming is like killing. And that has, like, like they, they lose their blood at the moment. So when we're so even emotionally charged for God or for good reasons, for holy reasons, for ethical reasons, moral, but we lose sight of like our grounding and our motion takes over, it could be that the person isn't grounding themselves with the coolness of the intellectual kind of cold brain that needs to cool the emotion down. Nadav and Avi who loved Hashem, they had such a passion that they ended up doing something opposite of what God wanted. That's where emotional mastery is so important, even in our spiritual practices. 
God says, erase my name. Basically, like, don't fight for me. <laughs> peace is more important. I want you to have peace with one another. So sometimes a person may really feel I have all the right to be emotionally charged because of what I saw and how they behave, and I have to give it to them. And it's actually, you know, these two days of Sphira, of Netzach Shebegvura and Hod Shebegvura, which I'll explain, is so necessary. Each ingredient, and by the way, I have videos daily on each combination of the spheras that help you master more your emotions by doing meditations on the sphere combinations. But Netzach Shebegvura is, I need to endure. Netzach is like, like endurance. I need to endure and have the strength to be able to continue on this battle of, of like not letting my Yetzahara take over me. But Hod Shigavura, which is Hod comes from the humbleness, I have to realize I need to humble myself. One is like my standards are for myself. And if I'm going to be strong with someone, I have to be very humble about it. I can't be arrogantly angry and putting them in their place and, and like in a, in, a, in a state of the opposite of humbleness. I have to humble myself to Hashem that, that I need His help. Me going bip, 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 and talking, talking, talking and spearing and, 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 and fighting the wars of Hashem, that's not going to help. That's going to actually repel the person. They're going to think I'm holier than thou? I have to know that it's Hashem that's going to help me with this situation with that person. I have to know that it's not me. I have to humble myself because if I think it's me, then I can't sit still and my emotions are flaring and then I lose maybe the whole battle. I might win for a second and I might get my way la da da di da But the expense of the bond, the expense of the relationship, at the expense of the peace. You know, in the Beta Majors it says that when the menorah was being lit, it had to be lit from the outside Mizbeah. Now, the menorah being lit is you having that emotional mastery. Emotional freedom, you know, that light, that influencer, because the light actually went woo far, just like he did. This Michael Franklin Ellis, so much so that they wrote a book about him, about how much he had that, that beautiful, like fun-loving personality. So to be that light, the, 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 the light had to come from the Mizbeach Hanachoshet, from the outside Mizbeach, which meant like to like the burning away of your, you know, your Nachash, which is like your snake-like behaviors. So like in order to be able to be a light, you have to first, right, conquer this snake-like, even in the name of God, energy, and then if you notice, it says how holy that Mizbeach was and not necessarily the Mizbeach closer to the, the, the Holy of Holies. Why? Because your outer behaviors have such an influence to bring other people closer to God. But if your outer behavior is arrogant or all over the place and, and emotionally you know, charged in a not good way, then that influences people not to want to be close to you nor be an example of what it is to be a toward you. So it's very important to realize the recipe. The recipe is get your godly soul back into your body. Get your godly soul nourished with Torah learning right after. And the Dibarta Bam is important to note. It's not just hearing a lecture from, you know, and hearing it. There's a power to saying these holy words that affect your brain. Note this well. It has the power to access 
your highest intellectual potential. This is the teachings of the deep Torah that helps us actualize our brain power. Right? We just said if a dog can have access to his brain power and be trained, how much more so we? But, you know, dog food is for dog, and dog training is for dog, but we have Jewish training. We have, you know, Hasidic brain training that is the ingredient to help train our animal within ourselves. So when people around you are behaving in a certain way, what you have to do, and I always say you have to, you have to build a castle around your heart. What does that mean? A princess is in the castle. She has, a, she has a whole castle around her. And not only that, she has guards in front of her castle. My heart is my princess, my neshama, my amazing qualities of who I truly am. And I need to build this castle. And this castle is the spiritual practices. And the guards are the wisdom of Hashem's Torah that help protect me so that I'm not as easily triggered and bothered and ignited when there is some burning fire around me. Minimally, I'm not going to put gasoline on that burning fire. And hopefully, with due time and slowly but surely, not only will I not put gasoline on a burning fire, but I will help put out the fire. My love, my compassion, my understanding that they're human in the making. And each person is on their own different level. There's a person that is, you know, like a kindergarten soul. They have a lot of work to do this lifetime. And me or another person in comparison maybe is I had Maybe a thousand Gilgulim. So I'm at a different level than them. So I can't judge them. I can't take personally their behavior toward me. It has nothing to do with me. Ultimately. So, yes, there's things that we understand in science. No, there's about? background people speaking. Hi, if everyone can mute, otherwise I'll try to mute uh, those that are on. Okay, stop. So hopefully that was it. We see in science that our emotional part of our brain, called the limbic part of our brain, naturally organically works three to four times faster than our rational mind. So it's very normal that a person will say something and your emotional part of your brain will get moved by it in a very not good way. Very normal. But we're taught to go above our nature. We're taught in this journey of our spiritual practices, we're actually brain training. Because science does show by learning, by meditating, by praying, we can increase this, the rational part of our mind to override the emotional first response. And I always say to people, and I learned this from Rabbi Leibel Wolf, that when things are happening around you and you don't want to lose your cool and your emotional stability, pay attention to your body. Is your heart fluttering? Is your stomach tightened? Is your face flaring with heat? You're emotionally charged. Do not speak. Like an ambulance, wee -oo, wee -oo, get out of the situation as best you can until you find that equilibrium, until you find that ability to be in that calm state. And let me tell you, take a deep breath. Let me tell you how even something so physical can help. First of all, breathing is more than a biological, biochemical act. It's more than just, you know, the diaphragm moving up and down or sucking the air to you know, to feed the hungry cells, but it removes waste. 
hundreds and billions of molecules are now working to lower your heart rate, to switch your autonomic nervous system from woohoo to woohoo. That's what a power of the neuro, autonomic neuron system that really helps not only us relax, but brings us to restoration. These are messages in our brain saying, okay, you can relax now. Okay, you're safe now. And it all is a matter of our breath. We take a deep breath in, oxygen goes in. So if you can't access any other tool at the moment, first step away, then take a deep breath, and the, the next tool is think of something else. Because thoughts, write this down, creates emotions. So if you keep ruminating, I can't believe this, after all I did for them, this is so ugly, I, ah, bah, 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 judging and ah, not being able to get it, I don't get it, I don't get it, then you can continue this emotion and the emotion will flare and it'll get stronger. Try your best even to smile by like remembering a memory of some good memory. By the way, the Lubavitcher Rebbe said that, you know, it's a custom to uh, take upon the customs, Midrash teaches us to take the custom of our, wherever we're at. So, you know, America has a big custom to smile at everyone. So it's, it's easier said than done to smile to some stranger. But to push yourself to smile at someone that just made you feel like... <laughs> but first of all, happy chemicals do get ignited if you're really happy. And it's a mitzvah to smile because this is the custom. Well, maybe not so much in New York, but here, top 10 rated LA people that smile wherever you go. Well, and it's interesting when, when the whole COVID thing happened, because I was pretty much raised in California and everyone would smile. And then when the whole COVID thing, even before the mandates of the mask, you would see people, they lost their smile. I'm like, California, where's your smile? Like it used to be, I remember it. So I'm here today to like tell you that the Lubavitcher Rebbe, we are gonna keep the smiles going no matter what, no matter who. We'll have that emotional mastery. We'll be able to have our soul powers shine like the menorah. Some people, when they come my way, they call me and they say this and this, and I start to share Torah thoughts on self-mastery. I didn't call a Rebbitson. I don't want to share in Torah. I'm like, and they're religious very religious and they separate psychology and the brain training of what's out there and Torah. If you don't know the source of the problem, you only have a half-baked solution for the half-baked problem that you don't know where it's coming from. If your godly soul is imprisoned, and you're, you don't have oxygen for your soul, and you're not nourishing your soul, then no matter what kind of treatment plan out there, it's just going to be half. And that's why so many people come my way who've gone to this and gone to that and did this, and thousands of dollars later and did this. And yeah, a little bit they changed, but barely after thousands and thousands of hours and 10 years and 20 years. And the altar of says, in Lukate Torah, you need to know the source of the problem to be able to have the solution. So that's where fire, water, and air, oh my, come into the picture. Let me explain. I had a situation where a family was staying by us and they just witnessed an experience of real devastating trauma. The rabbi calls us, please take care of this family. They don't have parents. Tragedy. And each person I could see handled it differently, way differently. 
I had a baby, Baruch Hashem, two babies, and each baby was different in my stomach. Sorry, men, but <laughs> I'm telling you, when I experienced those baby in my stomach, when I experienced diaper changing those baby, I saw how different it is. So one person has a trauma and they have a fiery temperament. They were born like a, with a fiery oven of a baker's oven. That's their nature. So they're the type of person to be more angry. They're the type of person to be more anxious and arrogant. And another person is born with more water. Actually, if you see these water and air, those of you who can look, I can send these pamphlets out also later it's at like the end. Up and up. Yes, you. yes. So some person is born with more water element and they are more prone to addictions. They love, love, love. They love food or they love money or they love honor. That's their nature. And another person is born more earthy and they are more lazy, <laughs> tired, sad. It's easy for them to get so depressed. Another one, you know, wants to escape their pain by eating or God forbid alcohol and worse drugs, God forbid. And then there's the air element. Someone who was born with They talk and talk and talk. They argue. They, 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 they have a power of, of the air element. But when they don't harness the fire, water, and air, earth of their soul powers in prayer, then, remember the Eight Sahara that wants to take the soul powers and use it against the person? That's where we don't have emotional mastery. Because... We didn't activate, harness, and use these powers in a good and holy way. So in prayer, you use fire, passion. You use, um, you know, you use air by speaking the words of prayer. You use the water element of pleasure and loving the experience of bonding. Because love is pleasure. Loving Hashem. And then the earth element is you, you ground yourself. You slowly say the words. You meditate and contemplate and use your you know, faculty of imagination in a good and holy way. And the more you use these elements, the more you're able to take it away from the Sahara so that it won't make you angry and it won't make you more prone to depression or addiction or arguing. So this is the source of the problem of the lack of emotional mastery. This is the remedy. Use your weaknesses as a barometer of how holy you are and how gifted you are. And trust me, some people have all four dominant. And they're so holy. They've been gifted with so much. And the reason why they're not able to master it and they, they feel like they're broken, they feel like they're, I don't know, something's mentally wrong with them or they're, they, they're, you know, they don't have the right chemicals in their brain. It's very interesting. You know the story of the chicken or the egg? Which came first? Hasidus teaches us, if you ivdu et Hashem b'simcha, which is la'avod, it's work, to program your brain with positive thoughts. Because the whole thing about praying is, thank you, Hashem, I have, I'm so grateful I have this, and I'm blessed that I have that, and I have blessings of this. It's all, you know, gratitude. And learning Torah then gives you all the positive influence of how great Hashem is and how, how He's lovesick for you, and you have all this positive. So, you see... You're not broken. You're not missing chemicals. If you have simcha, guess what? Chassid teaches us, and science does prove it. Then you have healthy blood. Then your chemicals are on fire. Dr. Sara Lazar Saad, she interviewed people for 30 years, people who prayed and learned and meditated. 
They did not have depression and anxiety. They didn't have aging of the mind problems like Alzheimer's and, and all kinds of things because they even do. They worked at keeping their brain happy. And happy brain makes happy chemicals and happy brain makes healthy blood and healthy hormones. And then a person would come to me and say, oh, you see, I'm depressed because my hormones. I said, well, maybe you're not, you, you know, you have a very high soul and you have a lot of gifts and you need to little upgrade on your service of Hashem to be happy. Then you'll have the healthy hormones and then you'll see that you don't have depression. And I promise you, 33 years of dealing with people 10 and 12 hours a day and duplicating these amazing results of more and more self-mastery and helping them get in line with God's wisdom. He gave us the remedy. And we can be so desperate running around all around the world when the treasure is in our backyard, as it were. And some people will just not want to hear of it. They can't believe that, that the remedy is here, right here, in our Torah. And I'm on a campaign because there are so many people suffering. And so many people these past two years suffering even more because of the isolation and because of the world does I don't want to go into the negative. You know, one negative word can actually change your brain chemical to like frazzle. One negative word. So I always stop myself because I just want to say positivity. Yagati umatsati tamin. Put the effort in. You will get there. And it's very, very important. It's very important to realize that you can't be too hard on yourself when you're not yet there. You know what the difference between a righteous person and a not righteous person? The righteous person gets back up very fast and moves on. The not righteous person wallows in the memory of his mistake. Then ends up being so sad. Then ends up being having to use the material world and the pleasures of the world to escape the internal pressure of not being able to live in their own skin. You have to live with yourself the most of all people in your life. You have to be your own best friend more than anyone. And I'm telling you, that is self-mastery more than anything. When you have the ability to accept what is, that is Geula now. That is when you have the redemption. Not that you reach the perfection of your being. Oh my goodness. No. When you can embrace yourself as is, you have more freedom. When you realize it's not you and your doing necessary. Yes, you're going to show up to prayer. You're going to show up to learn. You're going to also be very careful with your diet, which is another major key ingredient. Maybe we'll have a whole class on that a different time, but just a little something about it. Believe you me, when I read it in Kuntra Salvoida, when the Rebbe Rishab says, I'm seeing it right now, that alien thoughts come from the way you eat. It also comes from the way you act. So there's from the inside out, like really fixing your brain, filling it up with positivity, but not filling up your stomach. The way you eat affects your mind, and we know it. I mean, science shows that our gut is our second brain. And there's what's called a vagus. And when it's too polluted and too overloaded because it couldn't digest the food and it becomes putrid and acidic, then that acidic energy, that putrid, non-composed stuff, 
that's so toxic goes into our brain from the back of this vagus and pollutes our head. How many people, even after Pesach called me, after they should have had the most amazing redemption, and I even, like, you know, I couldn't believe how many. I said to them, did you a little overindulge in like, you know, those macaroons and the several layer matzah cake? Did you a little overindulge in this and that? Just eight days ago, your life is the same. Your life was the same. It is the same. Nothing changed in your life. What changed? Why all of a sudden today you're having a greater emotional imbalance? They almost say to me, you're right, I did. I gotta now start detoxing. And detoxing from the effects of wrong foods or even good food and holy food, give up the fish or whatever, you know? Uh, too much of it affects your brain. Research shows that, you know, whether it's Dr. Perlmutter and so many grain brain books and so many books out there, that shows that OCD thought processes comes from gluten, possibly sugar. I mean, sugar actually crosses the blood brain barrier. What does that mean? That means like normal food goes to the intestines and the digestions and the pancreas and it gets like broken down and then it's made ready to go to your brain. Sugar doesn't go through that process. It goes into your brain. Somehow it's created with some chemical that you have no barrier. And all of a sudden you're more emotional. You can be more angry. You can have more, you know, these obsessive thoughts. I'll never forget the day. I went over to somebody's house and I couldn't have the, I'm, I'm gluten-free because I am and have been in and out of the hospital from, you know, not being able to move my whole body because of gluten. So I'm one of those like people that do need the gluten free at the store. And it's not just because, oh, it's healthier for them. And I was actually in um, somebody's house and she had this kugel. And it wasn't a sweet kugel. I know, you know, I'm, I, I stay away from that. It was a zucchini kugel. And it was like, didn't seem like noodles or anything. It's just like zucchini and egg. I'm like, yeah, I can eat that. And I couldn't eat the bread. Normally I, you know, would bring either before the holiday or, you know, I, I don't know, I just didn't have a chance. So I'm like, you know what, since I'm not having the bread, I'll take two slices of this kugel, you know, like, I, you know, this is my, this will be my tadhuk. I come home, I'm not the same. My brain is like weird. And I, my thoughts were like somewhere like, I don't know, I, I can't, if, if you knew, you'd be like, oh my gosh, really? You, you, would, you would not believe. After the holiday, I said, the only thing I was different when I ate that, I was very careful. I said, maybe I should have asked, because it, it was like, it didn't taste so sweet. It was zucchini, and it seemed like eggs. She had put in flour, and she had put in uh, sugar. I just would not in a million years think that such a dish would have that much of sugar and gluten. I guess no wonder I liked it, I guess. But so we see that some people are glucose intolerant and even more so their emotional mastery will go out the door if they're not careful. So I have to, um, leave you with this because sometimes we will be a bit emotionally unstable and we ate right and we slept right and and we exercise to get the stress uh, and we had enough hours of sleep so our cortisol levels weren't so high and all of a sudden we may make a decision and we're like where did that come from how did i lose that cool where was my mind at the time? And I forever remember the story of Yohanan ben Zakkai when he was confronted by Titus who was going to conquer, uh, conquer Yerushalayim and take over Israel. 
And back in the days, oh, how nice they were, they would give a last wish. And so this last wish came to Yochanan ben Zakkai. And I guess in the heat of the moment, he made a decision, save Yavna. And after the fact, I don't know if he questioned himself, but the teaching is as follows, that, that people were like judging him unfavorably. Like, why did you choose Yavna at all places? You had a chance to save the Beit of Mingdash? Where was your head, basically? And the deep teachings of the Torah teaches that Hashem beclouded his mind. Because Hashem knew if Yavna wasn't going to be saved, then the Jewish people would not exist. Yavna had to be saved. And Hashem beclouded his mind and made him think of that place and not the Beit HaMikdash. Hashem knew if the Beit HaMikdash would be saved, there wouldn't be a people anymore. Because the learning Torah what was going to give the survival of our faith and our strength. So be kind to yourself. Sometimes a decision was made and you have no idea of the ramifications of what happened and why. How it had to be exactly that way. Even though you feel like an incomplete. Don't let it eat you up. Don't let it uh, swallow all of your emotions into despair and disgust. As the teaching goes, when, when, when Lot's wife was told, don't look back, you'll become a pillar of salt. My blessing to you is don't look back. What was, was, it was meant to be. Learn a lesson from it, okay. You know, brainstorm, how could you avoid such a thing again? But realize, a call me day shamayim. Everything is in the hands of Hashem. Even some moments where you're not your best and you're not on top of the ball. And the sentence, a call me day shamayim, means... Everything is in the hands of Hashem. Chutzme, except what is in your hands? Yirat Hashem. What is Yirat Hashem? Yira comes from the word to see. Do you see God in this or not? That's where you have free choice. And that's where you have redemption. That's when you have Geula. Because you're not going to be emotionally a basket case, because you did this or you didn't do that. You're the righteous one, I pray. Get up, face the day, don't look back, see God in what happened as best you can, see how you can see more God the next time around. And we have the time right now from, from this Nissan that we just celebrated, Pesach, Till the day of Matan Torah, the Arusa de la Tata, the work that we do down here, that we're taking from the Arusa de la Ela, from the arousal that Hashem gave us, all the gifts, like He gave us the gifts when the parting of the sea, the, the heavens were open, the spiritual powers were there. We have that gift now, and we can make the most of it, and we'll experience. Matan Torah, like never before. And when you end up realizing after the holiday of Shavuot that you don't do the Bessami, have you ever wondered why? Well, Shabbat, you do the Bessami, you, oh my gosh, give me something to smell, I'm passing out, my, my extra soul is leaving me. After Shavuot, anything and every little effort that you did to take the arousal of Passover and 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 get to a place of a little effort, a little more prayer, a little more meditation, a little more learning right after davening. Even just three pages. Even just one paragraph. Then the spiritual gifts of Matan Torah stays with you when it's over. You don't have to have besamim. You don't have to revive yourself because whatever you're going to get, it's going to be everlasting. I can't wait till you see the difference. I can't wait till you put yourself to the test. 
And I can't wait to celebrate Yerushalayim, Techa Bumiyad Mamish, with more and more emotional mastery. I hope any questions are either on Facebook or on YouTube or on Zoom or anyone here. <sighs> wow. So I have a yes. Okay. What if you have like you do all those things and then you also have like physical conditions where you have to like if you have like low iron and stuff like that, like how do you Oh, you do what you have to do in the physical world, but you'll notice it happened to me. I had major thyroid problems and I had major depression. And when I went to the doctor and they said to me, um, you have to take this, otherwise you will never get rid of the Hashimoto's and I don't know, all kinds of problems. I can't even remember. I didn't want to remember at this point. But, um, and then I started learning this and it said like, no, you can have healthy blood when you're more happy. So I started working on having more happiness. And then I, um, I, I, I went back to the doctor, even like, I don't know, it was like two or three months later, did the blood test, gone. So, but you have to do what you have to do in the natural order until, you know what I'm saying? Um, but uh, definitely we are the people that are above nature and we can access above nature reality on our mental, emotional, our physical and everything. But no, we have to eat properly. We have to eat the certain foods. It's going to give us extra iron. We do what we what it takes in the physical world. You read my book, The Health and Happiness, and I, I really address the physical as well. Yes, in the natural order of things, you are right. The Lubavitcher Rebbe actually brings a whole teaching on forgiveness. And he writes, if you look at the three places that it talks about forgiveness, normally if you learn about Shabbat, it's in one place. All the rules of Shabbat. The, the idea of forgiveness is in three different sections of the Rambam. Uh, and why? So one place is... Um, you know, on punishment and reward. So that when you forgive, you are actually averting punishment on them and you are rewarded. Another place it talks about forgiveness is on um, moral and ethics. Why there? Because when you forgive, you are creating a better you. You are empowering your soul to be the better, enlightened, um, evolved you. Then it's in the place of, of tshuva. And why there? Because when you clearly, wholeheartedly forgive them, and I'll explain why it's actually a real mitzvah to do that, then you empower them to do tshuva. Your forgiveness unleashes them to change to that better person that you want them to change. And that's why when we pray in the morning and we say, we're making sure, we must clear our hearts, uh, you know, of, of any negative feelings for someone. We have to like clear our hearts and really have obvious Yisrael for them, which means forgiving them. Then we can approach God. And the teaching is, if you don't do that, you can't approach God because you'll have carried a nick in your heart. And just like you can't go to the Beit of Migdash and have a nick in the Korban as a sacrifice to God, lack of forgiveness affects your perfection. And trust me, God's miracles, the way it's taught in our Torah, will help them do tshuva. You're not forgiving them is not necessarily going to teach them a lesson. You need something deeper to get them out of their rut, to get them out of their enslaved mentality and, and blocked you know, soul that had made them behave that way. And forgiveness unleashes their soul powers. And I've witnessed it again and again.
that's different. I mean, it's interesting, even the way it's written in there, it says in different places, oh, the victim forgives, and the this, and the last one, when you really forgive, it didn't say the victim forgives, it says the person forgives, because it's completely erased of what they did. This is just what I learned from the Labavitra, actually it's in my in my uh, marriage book, because that's a big one. It's very hard. Women especially can carry something for 10 years. Do you remember when 10 years, right? Exactly, and it stays there. You're like, ah. Oh. So definitely we don't have to fully forget, because, you know, in certain situations, you, you have to realize this is a, possibly a burnt, uh, uh, you know, if you're, you're, the oven is very hot, and you have to remember, you know, um, there is a reason God gave us memory so it protects us but we're talking about a complete and whole heart your brain can remember to protect you a certain way but your heart has to forgive wholeheartedly that's a little different you, you see the difference how do you then how do you learn the lesson if you forget if you, what do you forget? no we're not forgetting our heart is clear of judgment. Our heart is pure and loves them. We have a Havas Yisrael. We're not 100% okay. They're not 100% okay. But it's good to forget a little bit. Because <laughs> if you carry too much, it's not healthy for you, honestly. It eventually happens. You can't remember all details. Right, 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 right. Yes. I hope that helped. It helped me because it's not easy to forgive. And sometimes, especially when it happens again and again, and especially when you do so much and the return isn't, you know, like the way you've expected after giving. But the more you're free to just work on yourself and not keep looking at everything that someone else did, that's when you're free. And it, it, it's like um, a new lease on life. It's like you walk with that castle around your heart, you walk free that nobody's gonna enslave you into their territory of negativism. You just have Geula now. can you be present at all times? So remember, the, the, the spiritual practices helps your soul dominate more your heart and your mind so you're more present. But mindful meditations really help. Um, and you could do it even during prayer. You could, you know, for instance, Harini Mikabel, a lie, you could like close your eyes and, you know, see yourself having even like a mantra, my standards are for myself, and I'm gonna visualize myself walking amongst the people around me that tend to not be the way I wish them to be, and I see myself being a lamplighter, smiling, loving, being at the moment with them, not remembering what they did and what they should, and they're maybe not, and, the more you practice in your brain, because in our brain we have what's called neuroplasticity. And that means you can recreate neural pathways and create new realities. And just like a garden that you get rid of weeds when you put the seeds, right? So the more you practice in your brain a certain behavior, the more you can create in reality the brain's aptitude to manifest and actualize these new goals or new acts or new behaviors. And research does show that, and it's called neural pruning, just like you prune a garden, you can rid yourself of traumas, you can rid yourself even of 
like damaging parts of your brain. So like someone's in an accident and they can't move their hand anymore, God forbid. They can reprogram their brain to find new connections that normally you don't use those connections to move your arm, and they eventually then can use the power of the brain to recreate mechanism by which to get to the arm to lift it. So too, the brain doesn't know the difference between past, present, and future. So if you create a now thing, it's going to get in the habit, and this is the me that is the now. And what was just becomes obsolete. It just gets pruned out of your brain, and it won't remember to behave that way. And it's interesting, in the Tanya, the Alter Rabbi actually teaches us that habit reigns supreme. That if you keep doing a habit, even in your brain, then it becomes a new reality, which actually is really the really true you, he, the author of he says. It really is the essence of the true you. Even though it seems like, you know, you're faking it till you're making it, kind of, but it's really going back to the true you, meaning it's more and more revealing the true you. Yes. Which is interesting, there's a concept in psychology called recreate history. So you, and I do that, certain situations of certain traumas, I take them back in time and I create a completely different scenario and re, uh, like, um, redo the event of their life that caused them so much trauma and erase it by programming as if it was this and not that. So definitely, there is a place also for looking back in a healthy way, you know, like, uh, wow, next time I'm going to really pack the night before everything because I forgot this and I forgot that. And of course, you can look back and see what new thing you can do differently. But I'm talking about don't look back and keep wallowing that you made the mistake and that you, you know, didn't do what you had wanted to do. There's a difference. Wow, I am so thankful for this opportunity because I was gushing with emotions <laughs> after this last day and eight days of just, you know, uh, you know, one of the things the rabbi taught me, uh, Rabbi Sperlin, and he gave such amazing classes. And I just like, one of, I have to admit, you know, one of the hardest parts for me of Shabbos is that I can't write down things or I can't record things because like I have to really use my memory to remember the things. But some of the things that really was very fascinating, you know, in the, in the Pesach Seder, it talks about the wicked one and you blunt his teeth. First of all, he was saying they're really not wicked. They are in pain. They are suffering. And when you see people around you behaving in a certain way that's hard to forgive, right? Blunt their teeth which means, what is blunt their teeth? Normally, if an animal has sharp teeth, so if you blunt it, then it won't bite as hard. So we have to understand the people around us are in pain, and we need to blunt their, their attacks, their harsh words, they're in pain, so that then we don't take it as personal. And another thing he said, which was so fascinating, is that one of the reasons why we go to work I was like blown away by this, is so that we can see how good we can really be. Because when you're at work, oh, you're so pleasant, and oh, it's so, you're at your best, and everyone sees you as an angel, and you come home, gosh, I'm, maybe I'm, wow, I'm so different. <laughs> I, I, I can be that way. Going to work actually shows you how you really have the power to be the best that you can be. What's going on in work? If I act like an emotional wreck, I'm going to get fired. Even though the boss is yelling at me, but I'm staying cool. I'm not talking. At home, it's not like you're going to get so fired so quickly. <laughs> And it's so easy just to be lazy and not, you know, have that 
extra drive and that rational reason to keep yourself emotionally, you know, in harmony and, you know, in balance. So I always say, die, die, ain't no stop. Let us stop being so, like, easily the best at work or with strangers in the gas station. Die. Let's be as diligent to be as nice and angelic and emotionally our best with the people that do so much for us, for the people that we love. Ready? Set? Go! We're getting there. And I know it was so hard after the holidays to like leave the house. So all of you who made it here and all of you here on Zoom and Facebook, um, I, I, wow, Baruch Hashem. Nice to see uh, people show up in both places. And if anyone wants to join my Spirit HaOmer videos or I have two chats, one just for the 49 days um, please give me your name, number, I'll add you to the list. I have another web um, WhatsApp that posts where I'm speaking. I have yournewheights.com, which has a lot of my classes and all the Sphere videos up there. So if you don't want to get bothered, a ping, ping every day, uh, they're there. And I bless you that we should continue growing and learning together. And really, when I share it with others, it's more mine. So I have to thank you. For giving me the opportunity to share what how many people are in Zoom? What? How many people are in Zoom? Um and on Facebook Baruch Hashem. So Baruch Hashem. And my books are not all of my books are here, but some of them are there which is a lot of the information that I shared with you is listed in these books. You can go to Amazon.com, Miriam Yushami, or my website, which is YourNewHeights.com. Let's get there together. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thanks. I'm trying to see if there's any questions here. Thank you very much. Is there any... Ch Let me see the chats here. Maybe people... Oh, wow, there's... Oh, 18. Let me see. Hold on. I don't know how to do that. Oh, I, want to, I want to read the, the questions here, but it's not opening. Do you know how to open the chat so I can read the questions? Yeah, because I'm pressing the chats. Usually you can open it and then the uh, questions pop up. The chat, please. Should I come around? Yeah, come on down. <laughs> I feel like I'm getting back to you. Do you recommend like praying before you, I mean, like, meditating before you pray? Yeah, it's a really good start. Yeah. You've heard about Joe Dispenza? Oh, yeah, definitely. He has some meditations. I would do Jewish meditations also, yeah. like that are really directing us how to like redeem our soul. Yeah. Okay. Um, I press here. It's not my laptop. Oh, from that. Okay, that's why. Okay, let's see. Okay, so I'm going to answer some of these questions because I don't like to ignore people who spent the time. Um, let's just see. Wow, there's so many. Let's see if I can. Oh, that's why I'm having a problem. Okay, so let's go to the top. I'm yeah. so uncomputer savvy yeah. one day. Maybe I'm going to share my Okay, so, um, um, so someone asked, do I believe in taking medication? If it's really life-threatening, I've helped so many people avoid medication with this CBTT, Cognitive Behavioral Torah Therapy Approach. Um, and yes, there are times if someone is so in pain and suffering so much for a period of time, but it's really the extreme cases that I recommend. So basically, you just need a, um, you see the, the, the bar there? Yes. You need to click this button. Yes, this class is resumed. And thank you for your comments. 
And definitely um, the resources, as I gave before, you can get to... Uh, Thank you all for your beautiful comments. And uh, you can reach me at saveintheshama at gmail.com. Um, yeah, if I can help in any way, please, God. I'm, I'm a very full-time grandma right now, so I'm doing my counseling a little later in the day, but I'm, I'm juggling both, but I'll try my best to help whoever needs help. I also train different therapists. So if I'm too busy, I can get you to the right help uh, if, if it's, you know, uh, like, you know, if I can't get you ASAP. And you can reach me and I'll give you their numbers as well. Okay. Wow. Any other tech? I think that's it. That can help her. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, everyone. So I'll end the class now. To be in your chat. Yes. So I'm going to retype.